Hello. Um, uh, so I want to thank Samach for inviting me here today. Um, again, my name is Simone Zimmerman. I am an activist from the US. Um, uh, for those listening to translation in Arabic, it's on channel one. Um, so uh, I wanted to share a little bit about my own personal story before I kind of jump into what if not now is, what we're doing, how we got to this moment um, that we're in. Um, I grew up in very, a very active uh, Jewish community in Los Angeles, also a very active Zionist community in Los Angeles. Israel was a huge part of my upbringing and it was very much a, a, a core part of the story of, of my own family. My grandfather escaped from, from Warsaw in the 30s and moved here and uh, eventually moved to the US where, where, uh, where I was raised in Los Angeles. And um, the narrative that I really grew up with was to be very proud of everything that the Jewish people had accomplished in the last uh, century, half century, and um, to only really, you know, that we only have ourselves to trust and to thank for that. And, and I saw kind of defending Israel and being proud of Israel and the, the establishment and the uh, thriving state of Israel is very much a part of that narrative. And I, I went to study at UC Berkeley in part to, uh, to, to defend Israel on a campus where you know I was told there are lots of people who hate Israel and I was coming to tell people the truth. Um, and I think this is a story that is very reflective when we talk about kind of where uh, Jewish activism in America and kind of around the diaspora is at. This is a, a, a core part of the story because for many of us, um, myself included, um, I came to campus and I realized I had no idea what anybody was talking about. I was someone who had come to Israel so many times my whole life. I had family and friends here. And these words, occupation, Nakba, human rights violations were not at all a part of, of my discor the discourse that, that I had been raised inside or, or my awareness. Um, and it really came to a head for me during uh, actually one of the first very high profile campus uh, BDS debates that took place at UC Berkeley. And um, on my campus very much there were Jews on one side of the debate and everybody else on the other side. Um, Palestinians, um, other kind of progressive organizations, students of color, and um, I had a really hard time like understanding what are these things that they're talking about? What are, what are these human rights violations? What is this, you know, uh, indiscriminate killings in Gaza? These are, these are terms that I'm not even familiar with. And um, very much after these debates, you know, uh, Jewish students would head up to Hillel, the campus Jewish student organization, and everybody else on campus would stay at the Multicultural Student Center, which was kind of a, a hub for like all different kinds of multicultural student organizing on campus. And I felt sad and abandoned as a Jewish student, and I had, I had no idea why everybody else felt solidarity with Palestinians and, and not with Israelis and with me as a Jewish person. Because for all I had been told about how my community you know, did support social justice and did show up for other people, I actually realized that, that I myself and my community wasn't actually showing up for anyone. We were locked away in Hillel telling ourselves uh, these stories and not, not actually being part of these conversations about uh, racial and economic justice across the community. And I think that that is sort of a sad truth, at least in the US today. It's not that, that it's not just that American Jews are not applying our values equally when it comes to domestic issues and to Israel, but it's actually that our failure to align our values uh, in Israel has cost us domestically because in the name of standing up for Israel and the Jewish people, so-called, as we're told to do, um, we're told to actually check our other values at the door, um, our commitments to free speech, to freedom of inquiry, to the universal you know, commitment to, to civil and political rights that we cherish so deeply for ourselves. And, and so actually, in, in the context where I come from, support for the occupation has po also poisoned uh, alliances for Jewish people at home, made us unable and unwilling to join coalitions, and has caused many in our community to actively participate in stifling dissent, in persecution of activists, and other dangerous and immoral policies at home. Um, so for many, 
people, young Jews like myself, the kind of reaction to that experience was at first just confusion and a sense of betrayal. Why don't I know these words? Why haven't I heard these stories? Um, that's what led me to come spending a lot more time here to actually delve into the reality on the ground and to work uh, much harder to kind of crack open the conversation in my community about what's happening here. Um, and that kind of led me to, in the summer of 2014, um, when the uh, last war in Gaza took place, um, I found myself uh, sitting, sitting in, in New York City, feeling uh, outraged and heartbroken that for all the space that we'd actually created in our community, when it comes to these moments of, of extreme violence, um, all the space for discourse collapsed collapses. I mean, I think you guys here know that better than anyone because, you know, almost the entire society supported the war that year. It's like, what, 5% who didn't, I think? 4%. Um, and so, if not now, uh, kind of came to life during that summer by a group of uh, young Jews in New York City who basically uh, wanted to bring our grief, our rage, our opposition to the war to the doorsteps of our Jewish communal institutions. Um, we came together and first we said uh, Kaddish Yatom, the Mourner's Kaddish, outside of um, a major Jewish organization in New York City. We did a civil disobedience, people got arrested. Um, we called for another protest a week later. You know, first week 50 people showed up, the next week 100 people showed up, the next week 200 people showed up, and suddenly in 10 other cities around the country, people were also planning protests. Um, and we realized that we'd really struck a nerve. People from inside the Jewish community who wanted to call our community um, like to account and hold us accountable for um, the, the, the violence and the blood that in part we are part of. And, um, our message very much during that time, the call was uh, stop the war on Gaza, end the occupation, and freedom and dignity for all Israelis and Palestinians, knowing that um, all those different parts are connected. You can't just call for stopping you know, the war on Gaza without addressing the, the occupation and the inherent inequality that exists in this place. And um, we really centered our call around, if not now, comes from uh, from Hillel's three questions, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? Um, we know that actually so much of our community's uh, actions are motivated by, by fear. Um, and we know that our people are also suffering, like as Jews, because of this uh, endless cycle of violence. And, and we're actually dehumanized by, by being occupiers, by oppressing another people. If I'm only for myself, what am I? Um, Obviously, like Palestinians are suffering and people across this region are suffering in part because of um, our inability to take responsibility for our actions. Um, and if not now, when? Really calling the American Jewish community um, to be accountable for what we are participating in. Um, and yeah, so basically, again, I think over and over again, we see this in Israel and in the US, um, Jews falling into these same fear patterns. We're armed to the teeth and we're scared for our lives and declaring that there's no partner for peace over and over again while being unwilling to kind of look inside and see the ways that we've actually also been complicit and are responsible for what's happening here. Um, abdicating our agency, our responsibility and not acknowledging that actually what everybody here wants are the same freedoms and the same dignity and justice and equality that we have demanded for ourselves. Um, and the truth of the matter is, is we're not more safe because of it. Um, um, so at a conference on nonviolence, I actually wanted to take a couple minutes to talk about like what practically this actually means in terms of uh, nonviolent movement building. Um, so, so what is if not now? Um, after the summer, a group of us came together and kind of went through a year-long strategy process to actually build the foundations of a, a grassroots mass movement. And uh, we relaunched in 2015 with a mass training program in order to bring the most people possible into our movement. Um, and, uh, you know, to date, uh, since then, we 
we actually have over two, almost 2,000 people who have gone through these intensive weekend long trainings and between five and 8,000 people who have participated in, in public actions with If Not Now in some ways. That means coming to a protest, it means coming to a community building event, um, all those types of things. Um, we're active in 16 cities and on a dozen college campuses and the community is paying attention. Um, again, so how, how does If Not Now do it? What are, what are we doing? Um, if Not Now is a mass movement that seeks to change the weather in the community um, and force the question of American Jewish support for the occupation into the center stage of the discourse. Um, too much of the communal conversation is bogged down um, with policing the bounds of the discourse and focusing on questions that are actually irrelevant to the reality on the ground, the actual issues here that, that you guys are, are working on on a daily basis. Um, we're showing up for ourselves, building a Jewish community that is grounded and rooted in who we are and where we come from, enlivened by our rituals, songs, holidays, history, um, guided by our own traditions and our own writings. And we're showing up for others, um, both for Palestinians and those who are, who are, vic who are like facing racist violence back at home. And we're bringing that urgency to the doorstep of our communities, disrupting business as usual, modeling the kind of leadership that we want to see and forcing that conversation in public. And by choosing a kind of clear moral position, do you support freedom and dignity for all Israelis and Palestinians or not? We are forcing the masses in our community to choose sides and inviting the greatest possible number of people to be with us. So um, uh, it drives American Jewish institutions crazy that if not now doesn't necessarily take a position on uh, the BDS call, on uh, one or two state solution, on, on, on the question of Zionism. Some people in if not now identify as Zionist and some people don't. By asking that question, we're challenging communal institutions um, to, we're like di totally disrupting kind of the, the daily discourse in communal institutions, um, bringing the masses with us and opening up a real space in which conversations about the reality on the ground can take place and in which the communal priorities are being forced to change. Um, many people accuse, if not now, of polarization and I just wanted to kind of address this issue because I'm sure many people here uh, think about this. What we say is actually the community is already polarized. The violence is already happening, the oppression is already happening. All we're doing is visibilizing the fact that the masses in our community are already taking a side and what we're asking people to do is to consciously choose which side they're taking. Um, and um, I guess it's time to open it up for questions, but I just wanted to say that in this moment of kind of the, the unholy alliance between Trump and Netanyahu, that, that those kinds of partnerships and drawing those links um, have never been more essential. You know, we see children being detained in Palestine and in Texas. Uh, we see that police are beating protesters both in Haifa and in Baltimore. Uh, we see that Israel is trying to ban activists from the country and the US at the same time is trying to outlaw uh, calling for boycotts uh, at home. And we hear members of the American far right calling for shooting immigrants at our borders and enforcing in, in more stringent immigration requirements just like our friend Israel does. Um, so I guess, and, and we heard that uh, you know, we know that we saw that Netanyahu had nothing to say when Trump called uh, Nazi protesters in Charlottesville very fine people. And, and in this moment, um, I think for a lot of us, it's asking questions about like, who is this we? What does it mean to actually build a broader coalition that, that is fighting for freedom and equality for all people? Um, and that's a little bit about what uh, American, young American Jewish activists are doing to be part of it. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh. As an American Jewish and Hebrew language educator, I want to applaud you. I'm so proud of what you and your young people have, are doing. A goal, I hope, will be that young Palestinian students on the campuses of our country will join you. Has there been any interest on the side of the Palestinian students and the, gr the Palestinian groups that are very vocal on the American campuses in joining forces with you? 
Yeah, um, that's a good question. I guess I can say quickly that um, really, if not now's focus is on on kind of calling our own community to responsibility. So there are lots of Jews who are kind of in the Palestine solidarity movement working on campus with groups like Students for Justice in Palestine. I think that the more and more um, space that is created to like, especially to show that there are Jews who dissent against Israeli policies. Um, my hope is that, that the ground will continue to shift in the community and there will be more space for collaboration. Um, Cause Okay, recommendation taken, thanks. Yes, I'm very impressed. Um, in Combatants for Peace, uh, we participated in one of your training sessions in Boston, which was the first time I met, if not now, and I was tremendously impressed, uh, though I'm a lot less religious than the group seemed to be. But my question really is, is twofold. I, I think it's extraordinarily important that you're working on the Jewish establishment. But I, what I, my question is that there are a lot of friends, there are a lot of movements in Israel in the peace camp that have friends groups in America. Many of them have. Is there any cooperation with them? Because of course they try to reach the establishment, the Jewish establishment, uh, so I wonder if there's any cooperation with them in your efforts and with the reform movement, which is also very active in the uh, peace movement. Yeah, your question is like, is if not now partnering with the American Friends of the Israeli Organizations? Um, sort of, yeah. I mean, first of all, a lot of people from if not now have been part of kind of nonviolent activist delegations to the region here. So there's a lot of relationship building that I think has happened on both sides of the ocean. Um, a lot of it comes from just personal relationships and um, I think there are just actually a ton of, of ties and connections between members. Of, um, yeah, we work together. I like we don't necessarily work together formally, but I think there's a lot of like uh, relationships and collaboration and um, yeah. No, they do work. They do work together. I think it's like, if not now, focus specifically is on strategic nonviolent protests outside of Jewish communal institutions. And there's education and there's conversations that happen. But but formally, like, if not now's thing is protest. So a lot of those people, I think, come to if not now protests and share information and and that kind of stuff. Um, Uh, since since you're working with young people, I think that the future will be very, very bright for you because eventually the young people will overturn the uh, Jewish establishment. I hope and so. And it'll, it'll take time, but, you know, that'll, it'll be like a tsunami, hopefully, that the young people will just completely change the institutions eventually. I hope so too. Okay, I've been told that's, uh, that's it. So thanks, everyone.